Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast, with your host Nick Myers. Artificial Intelligence. Voice Recognition. Machine Learning. Robotic. Actionable Analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand how AI and voice technology are reshaping our lives both personally and within organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of AI and voice first starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Welcome to the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and I am here to help break down topics in emerging technology, artificial intelligence, and voice assistant tech to help everyone understand how these technologies are impacting our lives both personally and within our organizations. The Artificial Podcast is brought to you by Red Fox AI. Red Fox AI helps give brands a voice by leveraging the power of AI and voice assistant technologies like Alexa and Google Assistant. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring an episode, please send an email to the artificial podcast at redfox-ai.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere that you stream podcast episodes. You can also follow the artificial podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube by searching for the artificial podcast. Thank you for listening. And now on to this week's episode. Hey there, Artificial Podcasters. Welcome back to another week and another episode of the Artificial Podcast. This week, I am excited to welcome Donald Buckley to the Artificial Podcast. And I had the pleasure of actually connecting with Donald on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. And from the moment we connected, well, I should say offline, still online, but via Zoom, uh, we just started talking about emerging tech, specifically voice technology and, and with Donald's background in media, which you'll hear more about here in a, in a bit, he's really able to kind of form that bridge between media and entertainment and, and some of these emerging technologies that we talk about on the show. So I'm really excited to welcome him. But before Donald and I get chatting, let me tell you a bit about Mr. Donald Buckley. As former chief marketing officer of Showtime Networks, Donald oversaw the marketing, distribution, and subscriber acquisition marketing, creative and digital media divisions, branding, promotions, media, CRM analytics, and operations broadband, as well as emerging platform initiatives for the network that included Showtime, Showtime Sports, and Showtime Documentary Films. So Donald did a lot at Showtime. He created the marketing organization that launched Showtime Streaming Service in 2015, designed its strategic positioning, and helped to drive its subscriber growth well beyond launch projections. Prior to Showtime, Donald served as the SVP of Marketing and Digital for Warner Brothers Pictures, creating the company's first digital division while also co-founding Warner Bros. Online. Donald currently provides consultation to startups, programmers, agencies, analysts, and investors on topics ranging from OTT, SVOD, streaming media, voice media, and marketing. Donald, welcome to the Artificial Podcast. How are you? Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very, very well. Fantastic. I've really been looking forward to our conversation and, and kind of like I mentioned in our intro, it's just, it's it's seldom that I, I, I connect with folks who aren't directly in the voice technology industry like yourselves, who I would consider super users of voice technology and just with the various things that you've been a part of over the years, it's just, I, I'm really excited to, to talk about how, how some of this is really impacting the media industry. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, and you're right, super user is the nice way of putting it. I'm not sure my family <laughs> would uh, would choose their words so carefully, but <laughs> yes, uh, I do have a device or two around my my home. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I say let's kick things off off with as as I commonly do with with people I bring on the show. But you know, what has your journey been like so far, and how did some of your past experiences, both personal and professional? lead you to the roles that you held at Showtime and Warner Bros and, and ultimately your current role advising startups? Well, I was a movie guy for a long time, at, uh, as you mentioned in the, uh, in the setup at uh, Warner Brothers. Um, my career was uh, primarily based in New York City. I was able to uh, live and work there uh, with some very, very frequent trips to Los Angeles, but um, Started the uh, down the digital path very very early, along with a lot of my contemporaries at other studios, who um, 
probably spent as much time as I did late at night exploring the internet and then the light bulb went off and we collectively decided that uh, this might be something to pay attention to and perhaps it might even be a marketing platform for motion pictures. And that's kind of how it began. But I, I, I think the journey is really about being grounded in, in uh, creative solutions. And when you design something or you're trying to craft or formulate messaging, whatever that mosaic is that's um, really a product of creative thought and conception, when it intersects with tools and technology as they emerge and process as it, as it uh, becomes developed, yeah. um, you know, every aspect has its own set of enabling factors. And again, the light bulb goes off, you start connecting the dots and that's uh, what we, we and others like us in other industries have, have done with emerging tech. And I think voice is just another stop along that path, you know? Fantastic. No, I, I completely agree with you 100%. And, you know, based on, you know, again, the various roles that you've held at, at Showtime and, and Warner and, and working, you know, in the midst of, of technology is it's really just, you know, grown exponentially since since the internet really in, in the late 90s and early 2000s. What has it been like witnessing the impact of technologies like the internet, the smartphone and social media, specifically on the media slash entertainment industry? And do you think emerging technologies like AI voice, IoT are beginning to influence the entertainment industry more and more as we kind of head down this path here? Yeah, that's a lot to unpack. Uh, but <laughs> but I'll, Bit of a I'll loaded question. The, no, I mean, I'll, I'll answer the first part of that question. The, um, the impact has been uh, fundamental uh, in terms of how budgets are allocated, how people think about utilizing tech. I mean, in the beginning, those of us who uh, were trying to get money and attention and staff uh, to embrace new tech were, you know, we faced a, a, a daunting uh, uphill battle. It was, it, there, there were uh, mostly people who had no idea what we were talking about and didn't much care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was only through <laughs> perseverance and persistence that, uh, that we were able to kind of knocked down those barriers and we began experimenting and you know these things are when you're when you're making it up as you go along it's a lot more fun because you're you're about a year and a half two years ahead of the lawyers and (laughs) once once the lawyers get involved uh you know and of course there's a place for for the law and all of this uh but in the beginning it's it's just a lot of fun and you're making it up as you go along and you are actually creating a category that never existed before and i think that's where we are in voice today uh i i am as excited about voice now as i have been about any emerging uh technology um but as the acceptance of emerging platforms emerging tech new ideas are institutionally accepted and you start to see money flowing from one media choice to the other one media category to the other Uh, even though its velocity may not be uh, what you what you hope it is uh, you take it and you move with it and you make a dollar look like five and um, <laughs> use some sleight of hand and magic and creative people together in a room and you push it forward. And I think that's what's happening now. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. And I know one thing that, that you and I have, have talked a bit about in, in some of our past conversations, of course, and, and we may get into this a bit more as our, as our conversation unfolds here, but it's, it's that discoverability of, of different media, right? Because I mean, you know, at, at least... You know, in my life so far, it's always been one of those things where at least up until the last couple of years, it's like if I wanted to watch a movie, well, I had to choose from my catalog of Blu-ray discs or DVDs. And maybe if there was something I was in the mood for watching, you know, if I didn't have it and if, you know, if I didn't have a movie for it, I couldn't watch it necessarily. Even it's something I, I didn't even know existed. Likewise, um, with cable TV, right? Because there's only, you know, there's a lot of networks out there, but, you know, still, if there's, you know, say you wanted to watch a specific drama or you felt like watching a specific movie within a certain category at one point in time, unless it was showing on 
cable in real time. You, you couldn't necessarily watch it. And, and of course, discover necessarily new things in the way that you can right now. And of course, as we've talked about, voice is going to play a, a really large part in that. So, yeah, I, I can only imagine just kind of seeing this evolution, at least in entertainment over the last at least decade specifically, and even before that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, there, I think of it in two ways. You, you, there's discovery. I mean, you can discover things and then there's guided discovery. And, uh, the problem with the first one is that you could be flipping and scrolling all night long before you get to a place, uh, where you think, and it's just based on a hunch uh, that there may be something out there that, that might be appropriate, applicable, desirable for you to watch. Uh, then there's guided discovery with recommendation engines and algorithms and um, tools like that that are still in the, you know, really, really immature. Um, yeah. And I think the future is probably, and I'm probably jumping ahead with where you're going with your questions, but I think the future is probably going to be some measure of uh of voice with uh, peer-driven social recommendations. I mean, that's that's what I would like to see. I'd like to see us get to a place where there are communities. You know, the next great social network may dwell on voice platforms, and wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, it's it's funny. I think it was even a couple weeks ago. Like, because I'm I'm just trying to constantly come up with ideas, at least you know, for Alexa and, and Google Assistant, which is what we work with right now at Red Fox AI. And I, I keep going back in this concept of like a new way of dating people. I don't know why, but I think about it and I'm like, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, kind of like how some of the dating apps today work, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if you could just, you know, maybe give a list of different preferences to Alexa or Google, then be randomly connected with somebody else within that mini network. And you could just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, almost like you're over the phone, but it's through the intermediary of, of the voice application. I don't know, maybe a bad idea, but to no, I think it's different. A, yeah. I think it's a killer idea. And if I were advising you, I would have told you never to talk about it publicly on this podcast <laughs> before, <laughs> before you lined up investors. I may have to edit that out. <laughs> Specifically, yeah. I may have to edit that out, but you know what I mean? That's the type yeah. of thinking I have. Cause I'm just trying to think of like, what are ways that have already been disrupted greatly because of some of these new pieces of technology, specifically in the last 10 years, and how can voice disrupt that more? And that's one yeah. thing that I keep coming back on. But it's, again, we've seen the evolution of social networks over the last 10 years. Who's to say, to your point, that the new social network couldn't be completely with your voice and you're just randomly connecting with people on the fly? Yeah. And, you know, as, as things go uh, increasingly, you know, with people now home, um, there is a great a greater proficiency in the use of, of voice enabled devices of all kinds uh, just as there is you know in, in my primary world there you know there's there's been a huge uh, uptake in streaming services and streaming subscription services have all grown during during covid time uh, and I and I think that out of that out of this experience out of this uh, stay at home experience, both personally and professionally, there is going to emerge permanent behavioral changes. And that includes more proficiency with technology, more comfort with technology, and the gates will open to those who are smart enough and clever enough uh, to see the opportunities and, uh, and give this kind of newly emergent class of uh, proficient consumers what they decide they need and what they want through voice and and uh, it's going to be exciting to watch yeah no the streaming thing especially and i i think there's there's something in here i, I was curious about too because of course you mentioned a bit earlier about what it was like when you were working at showtime and Warner bros trying to create more of that digital mindset based on where things were happening did it take a lot of convincing at those organizations to get people on board? And we'll use the buzzword here because I really have no better way to say it with, with the concept of digital transformation and creating new products and services that leverage the internet and specifically streaming. No, I think Showtime was already there. Showtime had a, had a um, uh, highly developed uh, digital media division 
yeah. by the time I walked in the door. I, uh, of course, put my own fingerprints on the place, but uh, they, they did a lot of great foundational work before I got there. Earlier, when I was at the studio, no, there was, uh, there was no digital organization there. It, you know, it simply just didn't exist, and it, it had to be uh, created from the, from the ground up. And as I alluded to yeah. a little bit earlier, most of the people who held the purse strings at, in those days uh, really had not much of an idea of, of what we were trying to say. The good news in that is that they sort of let us go off and do what we wanted. And, uh, <laughs> Which works out more often than not sometimes, right? You know, it's like it was like a little incubator that we had going in New York that uh, we were just that quirky group who spent hours and hours and hours uh, huddled together uh, trying to figure things out. And we all wrote a little bit of code and some more than others. And I count myself among those who, uh, who wrote less. But uh, we all dabbled, you know, and, yeah. uh, and we did what we did. And then, uh, you know, the floodgates open, you know, and I, I call it the MySpace effect. Once, once people had uh, MySpace accounts, um, they uh, considered themselves um, um, digital media experts. <laughs> and that's when, the, <laughs> that's, that's, that's when the trouble started. That's funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, look, I mean, there is a time uh, in, you know, in the early stage, look, it, here we are in, in early days of voice, right? Where yeah. it, it requires a great deal of uh, understanding and expertise. It's, uh, you know, it's in the hands of the engineers right now. Yep. And it should be. But at some point, uh, it's going to be uh, consumer friendly and it will be within businesses. It will be everybody's business. It won't be uh, restricted to you know, the engineering team. Uh, there will be others. Voice will be ubiquitous across organizations right. and good ideas about voice and how it's to be deployed, properly deployed helpfully deployed across organizations will come from every corner of those organizations. They won't all come through the designers and the engineers, although um, you know, obviously some of the best thinking will come from those corners. Right. But as proficiency grows, uh, good ideas can come from all corners. And uh, the, the cool thing and the key thing is to be open to those ideas as uh, the business matures into whatever it, it is to become. Yeah. And I, I really think, you know, and compared to some other folks, of course, I haven't been in this industry too long, but you know, I consider three years, I, I feel like I'm, I'm relatively seasoned at this point, but I don't know. It's just lately, I feel like it, it's just, we're, we're sitting on like a, a pot of boiling water with this right now. And the steam is, is rapidly coming up and you can see it coming through that little hole that's on the lid. And I feel like it's ready to go. I think it's just a matter of it's, I think once, other large enterprises see other large enterprises really starting to use it well, both efficiently and to solve problems for, for their customers in, in a way that we haven't been able to before is when I think this is going to start rocketing. And that's when, you know, all the R and D is going to be poured into like, Oh, well, well, what do we do with this? And, and whether that'll be on the current platforms, I can't really speak to that because I have my theories where it may, or it may ultimately, you know, we'll have this ecosystem of hundreds, if not thousands of individual voice assistants doing things. But that's what I kind of feel like this industry is, is, is at right now. It's like, I can feel it steaming and it's ready to go. It's just a matter of when is it going to happen? Right. I, I, I would agree with that. I, I would, I would also say that we're kind we're just emerging maybe from the ugly banner ad stage. Of, <laughs> That's a really so good comparison. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, um, the flash tags and, uh, the blinker tags in the code, that's where we are right now. It, it, it's probably a little unfair. I think there's some, some really, really stunning ideas that are, that are beginning to be, uh, tossed around and developed, but uh, once the um, once the money begins to pour in, and once brands begin to get serious, and there are there are some uh, who are who are embracing uh, the, the the kind of early adopters among businesses. Uh, once they do, I think you'll see a lot of the 
kind of uh, homegrown amateur stuff just sort of fade into the background and yeah. uh, it will become a more artful arena than, than what we see today. Uh, but still n- no less exciting uh, for, yeah. uh, for this stage. Absolutely. And I think this is really, you know, you can, you can definitely ask anybody who's, who's trying to do some of this now. And I think the consensus is we're all still just trying to figure it out. Like, yeah. you know, there's a lot of folks who, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with claiming you're an expert and I'm a big believer in that. But at the same time, it's like, it's still such uncharted waters. It's like, well, what someone may consider expertise in one area of voice, another person, another person may have completely different ideas on it. And it's one of those things where there's not too many standards and, and guidelines with it. So it's like this big old sandbox that we're all just trying to build a, a castle that doesn't totally get washed away when the tide rolls in right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we're all, I think, you know, me probably more than way more than you um, and uh, forget the probably that's a certainty. I'm just learning, you know, we're, we are yeah. in the, uh, we're in the discovery stage. I'm learning. I'm learning by talking to you. I'm learning by talking to others in the, in the field of voice and trying to connect those pieces. It's like the process that I described in the open, you know, that you know that there is a creative solution lying out there. You just need to study and focus and learn before you can apply uh, those, before you can develop any solutions, you have to apply those learnings right. to develop those solutions. And that's where I am right now. Yeah, no, and then that's, I, I know exactly where you're at because that's how I felt back in 2018 when I started learning about this. I'm like, my God, there's there's so much. But again, you just talk to more people, you read stuff. And, you know, honestly, I think you're more of a, of a user of some of the tech in, in day-to-day probably than I even am. And, and sometimes I feel embarrassed to say that because I'm like, oh, I work in voice. I should be using these things constantly. But that's kind of what really fascinated me the most is you told me of some of the really cool things that you've you've gotten the tech to do for you. I think the one that still stands out to me is you were able to to have Alexa turn on water from a hose or something, right? Forgive me if I'm butchering what you mentioned to me in one of our. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 We're not gardeners per se. We threw a few seats down on the hillside and um, this is outside the city, but uh, yeah, I have some devices that are Alexa enabled that uh, connect to the, (laughs) to the, to the hose. And, you know, they're also on a timer. So it's, you know, it's not often that I actually have to um, use a voice command to to start the sprinklers, but I can if I want to. And yeah. you know, the thermostat is all you know all the uh, all the obvious applications uh, to to make your life a little bit easier are you know this it's sort of fair territory for <laughs> for a solution, and yeah. it, you know it's it's fun and it's also it's part of the learning. You know. Yep. Absolutely. So one thing that I've been wondering about, and I think we may have touched on this in our last conversation too, but I'd like to dive a bit deeper is, of course, you know, a lot of us who are currently working in voice technology and, and, and you know, I think if you, you know, the tech industry in general, everybody's kind of looking at this pandemic as like, all right, this is an acceleration point that I think is going to affect, you know, every technology, you know, especially the emerging ones more than others, but specifically, how has the pandemic affected the media and entertainment industry? And what do you think some of the lasting impacts will be? And do you think maybe the industry will become more reliant on technology as a result? Yeah, there've been so many changes from a slowdown, outright uh, cessation of, of television and movie production. Um, you're starting to see some productions happen again with COVID protocols in place, but it's just a, it's literally a fraction of what it, what it once was. There's some great work being done in South Korea yeah, um, because South Korea itself was a, was a great example of, of uh, public health management. And in New Zealand, there's been some production. Tyler Perry has been doing some great work here down just outside Atlanta, producing content. And there are many others, but uh, again, it's a fraction of what it, what it once was. So, so there's that. At the same time, the theatrical film business has been decimated by the closure yeah. of movie theaters. And uh, you may not see some of those familiar names return to the business. It uh, remains to be seen. Uh, here in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo just announced that movie theaters outside Manhattan in the, in the five boroughs 
uh, in the outer boroughs, will be allowed to open at 25% capacity, uh, which, is, which is pretty tight. I, I think I've got that number right. Uh, and they will be able to open concessions and concessions are the lifeblood of movie theaters. That's really right. where they make most of their money. So that's happening, but it, you know the business is hurting. And at the same time, uh, you've seen uh, films. Uh, the best example is Mulan, which uh, was a highly anticipated film from Disney, and it was uh, moved over to the Disney Plus service. Um, and it, it it was shown in a few theaters around the world. I think most notably in China, but uh, for the most part, the exhibition of that film was completely moved over to uh, SVOD. Yeah. And, you know, at a premium. So there was a, it was almost, it was a $30, $29.95 charge yep. to view the film, but that necessitated a Disney Plus subscription. So a couple of things happened to the economics there. Um, so, there are estimates out there. It depends on who you trust as your source, but there are estimates out there that the film did about $250 million in business domestically. Now, if a theatrical uh, film like Mulan were pre COVID, it's not unreasonable to expect that the studio might spend a hundred million dollars in marketing them. Oh yeah. So uh, their marketing costs were greatly reduced as a consequence of the move to their own platform. They spent not a cent on customer acquisition for wow. Disney Plus. Uh, you know, yeah. if you wanted to watch Mulan, uh, the marketing of Mulan was what drove you to the Disney Plus platform. And even if you cut let's say they spent 50 million, 50 million, which, which I doubt they did, but I have no insights into the actual numbers, but let's say they did. So they spent 50 or they saved 50. The, uh, the movie grossed uh, 200 and we'll, we'll settle on this number for the sake of this equation, $250 million. And uh, okay. So Call that prints and ads, uh, which is an old movie expression. Prints and ads, $50 million. So you're down to $200 million. In order for uh, Disney to have netted $200 million in the normal world of theatrical exhibition, theatrical exhibition, they would have to gross about $400 million. Ultimately, the share with exhibitors after negotiations would probably come in somewhere about 50 50. And that could vary, you know, yeah. the, again, for the sake of this equation. So, in this case, they keep it all. Um, they have now on that platform the equivalent of a $400 million uh, theatrical film. And uh, that's pretty enticing. Uh, that's a pretty attractive. And I think. You know, the more illustrations you see like that, and there may be several, there may be more than several, there may be only a few, we don't know yet, um, behavioral changes will, will result. And I'm talking about not consumer behavior so much, that's been demonstrated, people will watch on those platforms. Uh, I mean, behavioral changes in distribution and business and business rules. And it's all been disrupted as a consequence of, of COVID-19. And the other thing that's happening across the board is that uh, subscriptions on SVOD services have grown uh, for everyone. Yeah. There's been a tremendous velocity in, in growth. Some companies have had their best quarters ever in wow. subscription acquisition. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I, I I like that you brought up the Disney example because I think when it was last week, Disney announced that they were doing a complete reorg and prioritizing yeah. <laughs> digital streaming as like their new their new focus moving forward. I'm almost wondering if that was kind of like their big test to see like how are the finances of this going to play out if we don't do a theatrical release and go straight to to your point, Svod. Um, yeah, I'm sure it was an influencing factor. I mean, they're they're growth right out the gate was was tremendous and it was way way beyond uh initial expectations uh i always believed that there was going to be um some pent-up demand for the disney product it's just a great 
great brand, but yeah. you know, they bring with them everything from Pixar to Lucasfilm to Marvel, uh, plus the Disney brands. I mean, there's a lot to offer there. And those are, those are all brand names that mean something to consumers and it goes to programming. And if you've got the right. programming, you'll have subscribers and retain them. Right. Well, and that's what's interesting too. You know, the people who specifically wanted to watch Mulan, of course, you mentioned had to become Disney Plus subscribers. So not only, you know, was this, well, I don't want to call it an experiment because I'm sure it not necessarily was an experiment, but I'm sure whatever, you know, was behind the curtain with them trying this out, I'm, I'm sure the thought was, I wonder how many, you know, how many subscribers we can get, but then keep them beyond just watching Mulan. So I can only imagine the lifetime customer value that was added based on the amount of subscribers that probably came just to watch that movie. Yeah, and where we stand today, something like 80% of U.S. consumers have at least one video, a streaming video subscription. And the pre-COVID number was, on average, it was, it was three and a fraction, I think, and now it's up to four. Um, not necessarily nothing for uh, streamers to worry about. They still have to deliver the programming, which is critical, the scheduling of that programming is critical. The uh, consciousness of the competitive environment, what kind of deals are being made in a very, very challenging period of production, yeah, all has to be considered to stem uh, to, to stem churn because there is evidence that younger um, consumers will cut uh, as the longer this thing goes on and there's a lot of in and out there's a lot of cancellation there's a lot of testing there's a lot of free trial uh experimentation going on and you know churn is is a worry and it's and it's a factor that has to be has to be addressed by those things i talked about by programming and scheduling and um price points uh some services are obviously more expensive than others and if they can deliver the value uh they will they will have higher long-term value consumers who will stick around that much longer if if the programming is there. Yeah, which is it's odd. It, it's like I think right now the highest Netflix plan you can get, I think they may be the most expensive one right now. I may be wrong, but I know I pay because I have the highest tier plan because I have a lot of people use my account, but I think I pay like almost $17 a month um, just for Netflix. And I, I think that's the most expensive one that I actually pay for, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it may well be. It's um, uh, HBO Max is fourteen ninety five, I think. Um, yeah. Which is probably the next the next tier down. And um, Disney's bundle with Hulu and ESPN Plus and Nat Geo, I think, is uh, twelve ninety five, which is which is honestly it's a great value. Yeah. But this is you know, this is we're talking about all of these services and uh, I know my own personal experiences with my Fire TV, my Roku device, whatever I happen to be using, in trying to uh, determine which among these services, all of whom offer hundreds, even thousands of hours of programming, have what I want to watch. And this is where discovery yeah. and voice and guided discovery, I think, uh, will, will make a tremendous difference. And it may change the way we think about these services. We may be looking more at programming. It's a, it's a more decentralized way of, of uh, consuming entertainment. Absolutely. And that's actually a perfect segue. And I was going to switch over into, in, into what we were just talking about with voice and discovery. But you know, as we've kind of had this, this discussion and out of what we've been talking about so far as you know, voice as it relates to the future of media and entertainment, Entertainment, you know, what opportunities do you think voice technology specifically presents for for media and entertainment? And let's dive a bit deeper into how you may envision it playing a larger role in that discovery piece, because I, I think that could, as we've discussed a bit in the past, be the true game changer as voice comes into its own for media and entertainment. Yeah. So we've all had the experience of you know, taking the remote and searching through an on-screen alphabet, composing the search term that we use to discover programming. And, you know, it's a pain. It's, it is. It, you know, it's, <laughs> it's one of the things I hate the most about searching in the streaming services. Yeah, it's, it's awful. And, you know, my, 
believe me, my thumb has gotten a lot faster. I know how to navigate these things pretty, pretty, pretty well. But if I can simply say to Alexa or to Roku, uh, a, even a generic description of what I'm looking for and have the carousel illustrate for me in seconds. And by the way, you can do that for something. It, it, it's, we're beginning to see that happen. It's, I've had some pretty great success. When I was looking for uh, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, not too long ago, I had forgotten the, the exact title of, of the documentary and what service it was on. Didn't matter to me, honestly. And that's kind of goes back to the decentralization question. Did not matter one bit to me where I was watching it. I simply told my remote to find the social media documentary. And there it was. A second later, it was on my screen. And uh, that's a very, very satisfying customer experience. And that's where I think we need to go. We need more of that. Yeah, absolutely. And and I so I actually use probably because I have a I have a fire TV stick in my bedroom and then I use Apple TV in, in my living room. And I will say when I first got the new version of the Apple TV, of course, it came with the Siri remote and, and that voice functionality built in. It actually took me quite given the given, of course, working in voice tech, you know, I probably should have picked it up a bit quicker, but it actually took me a, a bit to get acclimated to searching for content that way. And, and I'll be honest, you know, the past two years that I've been using it consistently, the voice part just to search for different things, whether that be through the YouTube app, whether that be on Netflix or Hulu or HBO Max or, or some of the other services that I am subscribed to, it's truly night and day. And to your point too, I've done it before too, where I say I'm interested in a certain type of movie and then I'll get a list of recommendations from the Apple movies library, which just makes it so much easier. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's about ease of use. And right now it's a confusing mess, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, Because there's so much content, right? (laughs) So much out there. There's so much content. And as, of course, we come out of the pandemic, there's going to be even more, of course. So it's how do you how do you organize all that and and recommend things to people that, you know, they may they may not even realize, oh, this is something that I'd even be interested in watching. And I think some of the best movies and TV shows that I've actually seen have happened serendipitously by using the voice search function on my Apple TV. No joke. (laughs) Really? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, you know, maybe that's uh, somehow related or the beginning of my own belief that, uh, you know, serendipity plays, plays a role. And um, when you are with a group of friends and you're having conversations, which inevitably these days will come to, so what have you been watching? Uh, that uh, that little bit of and you know that's a serendipitous event right there. It's uh, it's the kind of unpredictable path that conversations take sometimes, yeah. and you will then become one of the people who watches whatever show or movie you were talking yep. about over over dinner. And I I do think the strength of that is so powerful that uh, it must be harnessed in some kind of a, um, a hybrid of peer-driven social recommendations with, with the technology that's, that's emerging. I, I, I deeply and sincerely believe that that's, uh, that's where we're going and that will be among the most efficient tools in the arsenal of discovery. Yeah. And I think about that too. And I mean, by nature, we just automatically tend, if somebody gives us a recommendation for any type of product or service, the trust factor of that recommendation goes through the roof. And we're more than likely to investigate that on our own because, oh, well, if this person says it's great, or if this person has used the product and says it's amazing, I may like it as well because you trust that person. There's that trust factor. So I can very easily see that playing out even beyond that to where the trust is developed more and more between users and these voice assistants to where, you know, say for example, you know, in the future, I want to find anything. Well, I can, you know, again, using Alexa, Siri, whatever it may be at the time to give me a curated selection of content from these digital libraries. My trust in that is going to 
to increase greatly. So more than likely, I'm going to just be like, all right, well, if I want to watch a drama and it has ranked it, you know, based on probably past watching preferences and maybe some more serendipitous factors, you know, maybe I'll run into something that I never knew existed. And, and the recommendation is what prompted me to actually view that piece of content, which I think is going to help a lot of people out as well. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And and I've been kind of playing around with this this phrase ear to ear uh, with regard to to podcasting. Um, the same is true if you uh, have a trusted podcast, you're a regular listener, you hear about, particularly if you listen to the kinds of podcasts that I do, which are um, are largely from uh, offshoots of news organizations. I won't mention them specifically, but um, if you hear a movie or television recommendation and you're you're trusting enough to be a regular listener to that subs- to the to that podcast, uh, interesting. You know, it's voice to voice, ear to ear. I'm not sure what to call yeah. it yet, but um, you know, I'm hearing about it again. It's another voice platform, and uh, it's a trusted source. And the next step is to, you know, tell my TV to, to go there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's ear to voice, I, I suppose, is a better way of saying it. You know, I, I really like that concept because, I mean, even now there, there are so many overlaps with media in that regard, right? Like, you know, for example, every morning I, I listen to my flash briefing that I have on my Echo device in my bathroom while I'm getting ready. And, you know, I run through like NPR now and um, I listen to this video game flash briefing and different things. But even listening to something like NPR, there's an overlap in the various other forms of content mediums that it takes place in. It, it almost it does a really good job at, at complementing the different mediums that you can get the information from. Um, so I, I really like that ear to ear concept because I really think. I mean, even now we may be in that, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly there. Certainly, we're in the beginning, uh, which is what makes it so exciting because we can maybe influence its its path a little bit. Yeah. So one thing too, I'm I'm curious. So of course, I know we we've talked a lot about about voice so far, but I'm I'm a huge artificial intelligence geek as well, and that's honestly more than anything what actually got me into the space. Just finding a a real deep fascination with that. So if you can comment, Donald, how do you think a technology like AI, and again, this may be another loaded question, but how do you think a technology like AI will impact the media entertainment industry? Do you ever think a machine, here's one of my crazy questions, do you ever think a machine could be smart enough to produce its own content and deliver that to people around the world? Oh, you need Ray Kurzweil for that question. (laughs) Good answer. Uh, uh, You know, I don't know. Uh, I've I've read a couple of his books and Singularity and all that. And I I, I am not certain. I think stories well told remain a deep human, uh, uh, come from deep human experiences. And I, I think that while technology, including AI of all kinds, can help the artists tell those stories. I think nothing will ever replace the artists. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's interesting. And I tend to agree with you. I think creativity that, that raw creativity that stems from, from really our emotion that we have as human beings. I, I think that's going to get, I can't even put a number of 10, maybe a hundred times more valuable heading into the next decade, because I don't know, I, I, I've read a lot of books and I, I am actually rereading one called life 3.0 right now. And the, the entire premise of that book is, is the author's making an argument for what could our society look like in the future when we reach the singularity point. And he talks about this thing where they have this AI that actually uses ray tracing and can actually do almost deep fake type stuff and actually create content on its own and everything because it learned through all the different hours and hours and hours of video content that's on streaming services and YouTube and and wherever it is now how to do that. But I, I agree with you. I think the storytelling aspect of that where you pull stories from human emotion, I think that's something that that I don't think machines will be soon to replace, to be quite honest. I don't. Yeah. I mean, look, I could be wrong. I could simply be resistant, but I have deep regard and respect for artists and writers. And yeah. uh, if, it, if it is going to be, if it is going to happen, I don't want it to. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> no, that's a completely valid argument. I think there's probably be a lot of people, and including myself in many ways, even though I'm, I'm a huge AI optimist who, who agree with you because there's just some aspects of, of art and creativity that it's like, how could a machine ever, ever come close to, to taking that over, you know? And that's yeah, and I've I seen, often think I, about. I've seen some great examples of, you know, online of kind of trying to uh, test whether or not the, the figure on the left or the figure on the right is real or AI. And they are remarkably convincing yeah. as avatars of human beings, but they're not human beings. And, uh, you know, maybe someday this will happen. But um, again, I'm. I'm not in any hurry for it to happen, and, <laughs> and I may be, I may, I may be just uh, completely resistant. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I think I fall more in line in that in that department with you, where I'd, I'd rather there still be that that raw human element of creativity and and media and entertainment at least, because I, I think there's just a huge emphasis on that storytelling part of it that is is just so unique, and I would I would yeah. be hesitant to watch that go away too. So we've talked a lot, of course, about. Um, you know, a lot of things, but, you know, we focused a lot on movies so far. One thing I'm interested in too is, you know, there's a lot of talk now about, you know, as we we talk about these emerging technologies and internet infrastructure only increasing over the next decade, for sure. Of course, with the advent of 5G and some of this different stuff, what do you think the future of network TV will be? Like over the next 10 years, will network TV still be as large as it is now? Or do you think everyone will be consuming more personalized media through specifically streaming services and, and the various platforms? Yeah, the latter, I think, is is probably the best snapshot of, of where I think it's going is uh, that the sort of centralized power that was once enjoyed by three or four major television networks will continue to recede. It doesn't mean that their businesses necessarily will, will end. I don't think they're going to end. I think they're yeah. going to pivot. They're going to, they're going to shift. It'll be a, um, a distributed uh, network as opposed to a centralized network. People, um, you know, with the, with the one, um, I mean, we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about movie studios or television, but yeah. Disney Disney is an, is kind of a brand in and of itself, uh, which should be outside of any discussion like this. I think. Yeah. But you know, the television networks, the the broadcast networks, which are still very very viable businesses, um, enjoyed a, a jump in viewership during. Uh, certainly during the early months of COVID, I think some of that has fallen off with the emergence of more streaming services and more AVOD services, but they're in the AVOD service business too. I mean, CBS, Viacom CBS has Pluto and Fox yep. has Tubi and, you know, their, um, their businesses are changing and we, we see that, that in, uh, in stories like the one that you mentioned earlier about Disney uh, every day, there are very, very smart people inside those organizations who recognize change and who will, in if they're smart, uh, if they remain smart, if they keep hiring smart people, uh, will adjust to the times. And I think it will transform from a centralized machine to a distributed model yeah. and um, um, fundamentally change what we all once knew as the television landscape. Yeah. And it, it's interesting you bring that up too, because, you know, you kind of look at the big networks now, right? Like, of course, you have ABC, Fox, NBC. You know, I, I think NBC out of out of all the, well, of course, ABC is owned by Disney. So maybe that one's a bit negligible here, but, you know, NBC is probably the only one I've really noticed. Of course, they came in with their Peacock streaming app and different things, and they have the different tiers where you can get ads and, you know, you can pay more and to not get ads and different things. So it's it's like they're recognizing the change, but you know, I, I think it comes down to you can recognize the change, but you have to have, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, the content to match that change, right? <laughs> like, it's one yeah. thing to just be like, we have our own streaming platform, but if it's nothing that's like, I have to be on Peacock, you know? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of different paths, though, in that, uh, in this conversation. One one is, uh the, so there are the, the programmers and then there are the aggregators. So yeah. the, the programmers like NBC, um, very, very smart in one sense because the 
advertising sales infrastructure of the network was already in place. So yeah. agency, brand relationships, all those things uh, did not have to be learned. You know, that's um, something. So let's say if Apple jumps into that business, they have no such infrastructure. Right. Right. The best path for them is, is some acquisition of some entity that has it. Um, Viacom CBS, they have years and years of expertise, relationships with brands and agencies. Uh, they can utilize those uh, uh, skills in, in the AVOD or fast TV space. And, uh, and uh, I consider these uh, AVOD and fast services, ad supported services to be kind of gateway drugs for SVOD. Yeah. You know, if you can, if you can utilize those platforms as, uh, as uh, themselves marketing platforms for, uh, for upselling to SVOD services again, but you're right. Going back to your original premise, you need the programming. You programming is, uh, it's like we're going back in a circle. Programming is critical. Scheduling is critical. Stemming churn is critical. Right. And you've got to deliver what people want. And you've got to make the experience of getting there easy and frictionless and fluid and, and even fun, even enjoyable. That's where I think, you know, people like you and your contemporaries and your colleagues in voice and, you know, maybe even me someday um, <laughs> can, can, can help, help them get there. Yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting you, you brought up Apple too, because as, as I kind of think about what we've been talking about here, it's not even so much that the networks just have competition with, you know, more of the individualized streaming on demand services and, and just other networks in general. But now the tech companies are getting into the game, right? Like look at some of the shows that Amazon is producing, right? Um, you know, the same with you know, I, I don't think it's been nearly as popular as, as Amazon, but like, you know, Apple's producing their own their own content now for Apple TV Plus. And so I think that's an interesting to think about too. It's like, all right, these these tech companies, because of all their money and power, of course, are like, all right, well, since we're kind of providing the platform, you know, for people to access these different services, might as well capitalize on our own content machine as well. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And they were and they were smart about it. They both of those two examples that you mentioned went into the pool of talent in Hollywood and hired good people. Yeah, to to run those businesses for them. So, you know, the Amazon folks and the Apple folks uh, who are doing those things have done that work for major networks, for major studios. They know what they're doing. Uh, it's just specifically when you get into the area of ad supported content. Yeah, um, you have to monetize those businesses some way, and, and in order to do that, and maybe they will. You've got to have the structures and the people in place uh, to do that. And um, hopefully that's, that's what they'll do. Or, or they, as I said, they'll acquire that talent. You, know, yeah. you, can either, you can either try to build it from the ground up, which I don't think is a great idea, or you can acquire it. Yeah, which definitely seems to be the MO of a lot of these companies. <laughs> More yeah. than anything, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, as we kind of wind down our, our conversation here, Donald, I'd, I'd like to leave on on this one question here because um, I think you know I, I love the different perspectives that people have on on the on what the future could hold, especially in a in a niche like what you're in with with media and entertainment. But you know, imagine you could snap your fingers and travel ten years into the future. So in 2030, how do you envision people consuming media and entertainment? What does that look like in 2030? Yeah. Um, you know, whenever you have the conversation about uh, what superhero skill you might want to have, uh, yeah. the two, the two that I choose are time travel and invisibility. <laughs> and so I had a, I had an idea you were going in this direction with this question. And I thought it's really too bad that those dreams can't come through, come true because right. I, would head, <laughs> I would head right for 2030 and have a good answer for you. Look, I, I don't know, honestly, yeah. I don't know what it's going to be. That's a perfect but, answer. <laughs> but I think the trends are there. Right. I think it's what we were talking about. I think it's going to be highly personalized. It's going to be um, a, distrib a distributed model. Um, we already talk about uh, 
delivering entertainment content to people how they want, when they want, where they want. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be more of that. Uh, it, the only challenge to that path that I see is kind of a deep seated desire for shared experiences mm-hmm. that I think still exists. And that will emerge, I think, in some way that we haven't seen before. There will be shared experiences that uh, in entertainment that happen. They just may not happen in the ways like in movie theaters with 500 or 600 people in a room together. Uh, They may be some combination of virtual and in-person real world experiences. I don't know yet. They might be smaller venues. It's kind of like the workforce. What's happening with the workforce now with these companies like Facebook and Twitter announcing that you know, working from home may become a permanent, and I think one of them at least has has said that working from home is a, is a permanent uh, policy. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in spite of that, and I see this when I'm in my consultations, uh, which include some companies that are that are going down this road. Uh, the they're betting that. There will be some hybrid of work at home and some sort of shared work social experience a couple times a week. And I, and I think that's uh, a recognition of this deep need for people to socialize with one another, yeah. uh, whether it be for work or pleasure. And um, obviously, we're talking about both here. But uh if I had to predict 2030, <laughs> I would say it's some amalgam of, you know, the distribution model that that I talked about and the need for for sh- uh, social interaction and shared experiences. And that's the best I can do for you. No, I think that is an that is an excellent response to that question because I agree with you. I think especially as we, of course, exit the pandemic and things start changing and more things that did change become more solidified. I definitely think the way we've, you know, for the past, you know, however long movie theaters have been around in different things that that is definitely going to change. And, and one thing I was curious too, I'm like, do you think AR or VR will play a role in that? Because I was actually for a, for a brief stint in, in my career was actually in the VR space for just a bit. And I always thought like that could be a really interesting way to consume media. Do you have any, like, do you foresee that playing a part at all or just more or less? Yeah. Than what you've been saying? Uh, well, I'd, I would put my money on, on AR, not VR. Um, I, I, and mm-hmm. those are largely for reasons of scale. I think it's a lot easier yeah. to achieve scale in uh, augmented reality than, than virtual reality. Um, and that, is partly informed by standing on very long lines for AR experiences at South by Southwest and places like that. Where, <laughs> you know, it was one, one person at a time. And I thought, this is not going to work. This is not a good yeah. business model, but AR um, is more democratic. It's more universal. It's more easily deployed. It's uh, and it's helpful. It actually offers up some real mm-hmm. world uh, helpful solutions for day-to-day problems, issues, challenges that we have, you know, mapping, for example, and, um, and uh, reaching, your, reaching your destinations and landmarks. And um, years ago, did, 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 a, did something for Universal Home Video on um, the Minions. Uh, we, we developed a, an app that was, that was something quite like the the uh, Pokemon experience. And this was years before that happened. And it was a big hit. And we had markers all over the world. Um, and it was, uh, it was at the very, very beginning of uh, the Despicable Me uh, yeah. franchise. And uh, so it might have been bigger had it had more brand recognition like, uh, like Pokemon does or did uh, when their AR experience launched. Uh, but there were signs of uh, deep engagement, uh, far more than than we expected. And I and I think, well, I mean, we've seen other examples of that. I sometimes look at the AR content in the New York Times, mm, um, yeah, through my through my phone in the little cardboard box, and it's you know, it's not perfect yet, but uh, 
I, th- I do think that uh, the possibilities of scale uh, are, yeah. are much better there. Yeah, I would I would agree one hundred percent. You can you can already see kind of what the the tech companies are placing their bets on, right? Like you know, Apple is consistent consistently, you know, talking about how they're they're really trying to make the iPhone more of a an AR based device ultimately. And of course, I think they got something working in the wings, an AR an AR a standalone AR device that I've been been reading about in different forums and stuff. And of course, Amazon's had it where you can you know AR different furniture in your room through your phone for a couple of years now. So I agree with yeah. you. I think the scalability factor of that is it's here and it's it's able to be tapped into quite quite readily as opposed to to VR for sure. So yeah, I think maybe AR could could play a role in, in how we consume stuff too. But even at Showtime, we did some experimentation with the with the haptic uh, potential of of the iPhone, something something we did for Homeland, which was a lot of fun. And and again it was early, but uh, you know, lots of promise and the yeah. ability to, you know, this is you have this device in your everyone has this device in their pocket. And you know that for me is, uh, you know, kind of an attractive proposition that tells me it's worth paying attention to. Absolutely. Well, Donald, this has been such a great conversation. It's like an hour's already gone by. It feels like it's been 10 minutes. So <laughs> yeah, it's been my pleasure. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. It's fun. Awesome. Well, if anybody wanted to get in touch or reach out to you, what are some of the best ways for them to go about doing so? I've kind of gone underground with my social media <laughs> presence. Uh, I'm largely a lurker and an observer, um, a because I want to be, and two because yeah. I need to be. Uh, uh, so um, I'd be happy if you don't mind to, uh, if anybody really wants to get through to me. If you don't mind, uh, uh, they can do that through through you, and maybe you can send it my way. Sure. I'd be more than happy to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, no, I, I've gone underground the past few months myself. It's only really been within the last few weeks. I've gotten more active on all my social media too. And I think a lot of people can probably agree with, with everything going on. That's been the case. But yeah, I'd be more than happy if, if anybody wanted to, to reach out to you to, to kind of make that intro and, and do it that or way for sure. You, look, I mean, the, I have a, a uh, I have a presence on Instagram, but it's mostly me uh, preparing food and chopping wood. Um, <laughs> but, Love it. Uh, but I'm on, um, but I'm on Instagram. Uh, 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 excuse me, Insta- but I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. So you can find me on LinkedIn, and and uh, that's that that could be a that could be a great way. Awesome, fantastic. Well, Donald, thank you so much again for for taking the time to chat with me. I, it was a lot of fun. I I learned a ton, and like I said, I was really looking forward to this conversation just because, you know, I I really haven't had the opportunity to talk to anybody who can kind of draw the the parallels between all this emerging technology coming coming into the fold here and and the impact that's going to have on the media industry that in so many ways affects every single person's life so well it's been my great pleasure nick thank you and uh happy to do it anytime uh down the road yes thank you so much we'll chat soon all right take care bye artificial intelligence voice recognition machine learning. Robot. you've been listening to the artificial podcast with your host nick myers nick myers to stay up to date with all our latest episodes you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify stitcher and google podcasts to learn more about how your organization can benefit by unlocking the power of ai and voice visit www.redfox-ai.com Until next time.